Now, without further ado, uh, let me pass you over to Mark, who's going to get into those top 10 bits of marketing bullshit. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Russell, and hello, marketers everywhere. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's time for the all-time top 10 marketing bullshit countdown. Before I begin, let me just explain how we got to this place and, and where this list comes from. So about six months ago, those marketing geniuses at Mondelez decided to change the concept of marketing in their company, at least, and rename it humaning, humaning um, rather than marketing. And uh, I, what does that mean, you may ask? Well, I, I really don't know what it really means, but here's the video from Mondelez to explain what the concept means. Today, every human on earth will wake up hungry for connection. Our marketing needs to feed the human hunger for connection too. We need to start listening, empathizing, connecting. Today, we need to stop marketing and start human. Marketing made right, first snack be made right. Utter, utter bollocks, right? And I wrote a helpful column in Marketing Week that, that week, basically saying humaning is, is total marketing bullshit. And I was uh, overwhelmed by the response, not of people who were defending uh, humaning. Everybody pretty much unanimously thought it was bullshit, but pointing out that it, you know, it wasn't the most egregious example. And I don't disagree. In my original article, as Russell's already mentioned, I, I listed what I felt at the time were my top 10 pieces of bullshit. And you can see just there that Mondelez only scraped it into the list, uh, replacing Ernst & Young handily enough, uh, coming in at number 10. But really the main response from most of the readers at Marketing Week was your list is missing far more pieces of bullshit than, than we thought you were going to mention. And that really made me think um, about what I had missed and some of the excellent points many of the readers of Marketing Week made. So I did something I very rarely do. I, I changed my opinion uh, based on the feedback of the readership. And so um, what we'll do in this session is go through the revised, user-generated, crowdsourced, definitive, um, all-time list of marketing bullshit courtesy of about 450 comments that were sent to me um, after the column appeared. And my goodness, we had a lot of comments from a lot of people. And I must admit, well, I mean, some of them were shit, but some of them were really, really good. Now, a quick call out here to Mukhtar S, who's a senior assistant professor at Sri Balaji University in Pune. Uh, Shri, uh, Ms. Mukhtar was very concerned how these scores were calculated, and I assured him at the time that it was highly, highly scientific. But just for everyone else's benefit, here's how I've ranked this top 10. So there's a nonsense factor, which is just how much bullshit is this actual concept? How nonsensical is it? But there's also a damage score as well, which is it might be nonsensical, but maybe nobody's noticed. What damage has it done to marketing thinking because it's had an influence or attraction, okay? I'm going to score both of those out of 10 um, and then multiply them to create a marketing bullshit index score, which obviously could be up to 100, okay? Just to illustrate, alas, humaning is still bullshit, but it's no longer in our top 10, thanks to the new entries. Why is that? Well, humaning is massively, massively nonsensical. It scores nine on the nonsense factor scale, but it's really had almost zero impact outside of Mondelez, and I might imagine quite a little, uh, if any, impact inside the company either. So it only scores an 18, which means effectively it's it's not going to trouble the scoring anymore. Now, one other point before we get onto our league table. Um, uh, this is a complex um, scientific piece of work, and there is a secret formula, as I've studied and really waded into this bullshit in great detail in recent weeks. I've come to appreciate and understand marketing bullshit at a level, frankly, that I don't think anyone else can appreciate. So my complex formula captures what's necessary to produce truly world-class levels of marketing BS. And 
Many of you don't have a, a, a training in, in, in algorithmic equation modeling. So let me break this down for you in a little bit more detail. I think you need four things, four or five things to really produce world-class BS. First, you've kind of got to be deluded, right? Whoever came up with humaning was a bit deluded about the nature of the world and generally not getting it. You've also got to be quite earnest and unable to take the piss out of yourself and realize you're being stupid. Next, you need a fair old slice of ego. You have to believe you actually know stuff and you're going to see some massive egotistical bastards in our, in our top 10 list. You've really got to have an overstated vision of your own intelligence to make the list. You've obviously also got to be massively wrong. Your ego doesn't realize it, but you've still got to be wrong. There's plenty of people with massive egos that are also correct. To make this list, you've got to get it completely wrong. And finally, you've got to have quite a lot of impact. Those first four elements, there's plenty of idiot marketers out there that have those things, but frankly, no one ever listens to them. You also need to have proper impact to make this list, as you'll see. One of the questions several people asked me when I published the original list is, did I feature in that top 10 list? Uh, Chris Garner, for example, was horrified when I included Seth Godin in my original list because he's occasionally very wise, but often I think the, the analogy I used or metaphor I used was it was like a bingo machine being operated by a drunken chimpanzee. He says some things sometimes that are just nonsensical. And, and, and to be fair to Chris, he took he was taken aback by this and said, look, where are you on the list, Mark Ritson? And I pointed out to him that, you know, I'm trying, but I'm nowhere near this level of Jedi skill to make the top 10. And I've looked, you know, with some humility at where I'm going wrong. And I think, look, I have the ego. I'm certainly deluded and I'm often wrong, but I'm not very earnest. I'm, I'm delighted to take the piss out of myself. And I don't have the impact of some of these heavy hitters. I'm working on these things, but I'm not there yet, Chris. But I hope in the future to break into the top 10. Let's keep our fingers crossed. All right, enough preamble. Let's get to the list. I know that's why you and your colleagues are here today. Let's revise the list from 10 all the way up to one. And let's start with number 10, which is WeWork. Many things about WeWork, but specifically its vision of, of the role of profitability in a successful business. So young Adam, the founder of WeWork, you know, there's, there's much been written and many more things will be written about this terrifically fascinating uh, uh, man. Um, he said many things. Um, I'm going to highlight three because he's kind of like the poster boy of all the bullshit that currently resonates around marketing and business in general. He, he kind of brought, he was like a lightning conductor for all of it, right? Um, the three things I would pick out, first of all, these are actual quotes, right? I believe that doing the right thing will not only create the best culture and the best product, but also make the most money. This is a particular delusion of many companies. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do the right thing. It's just that we shouldn't expect it to actually make us the most money. There are shitloads of companies doing the wrong thing and making a lot of cash. And there's a lot of companies doing the right thing and making no money at all. This belief that there's some causality between these two things is nonsensical. We should do the right thing because it's the right thing. Anyway, number two, uh, he said, we work is my fifth venture. I failed in my first, second and third and had mediocre success in the fourth. The implication is that his fifth venture we work is a massive success and of course it's one of the biggest failures of recent times but i've picked this quote because again there's a total fucking obsession with failure i did an interview last year and one of the introductions in the little questionnaire was what's been your biggest failure and i thought to myself well i, I could make something up to look humble and like i've learned something but the reality is i mean i've not been wildly successful in everything but i'm quite happy to say i haven't completely failed in anything. And I don't think that's a bad thing. When I was at MIT, everyone was obsessed with failing and learning. Sure, but but you could also just succeed and learn too. And, and I think, you know, the WeWork story also illustrates this obsession with failure is good. But the reason I really want to pick on WeWork and Adam's ridiculousness is his point about profitability. Uh, and, and as he says here, you can choose when to be profitable, yeah? That's horseshit, but again, it speaks to this nonsense business culture that says 
profitability is overrated. You don't need to make a profit. You can, as long as the company is valued, we're a D to C business. We don't have profits. We have losses, but we have a long term plan for the market. Blah 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 blah. In the last ten years, we've become strangers to thinking about profitability. And I would contrast Adam and the team at WeWork with one of my heroes, Alan Mulally, who's from Ohio and is an engineer and took over at Ford when Ford was quite fucked. And there was a lot of explanations in that first six or seven weeks why Ford was losing money and why it wasn't necessarily something that, that he should worry about. And Mulally kept saying the same thing. If a business is losing money, there is something wrong with it. Now, there are exceptions. Let's start with Amazon. But we've kind of taken Amazon's ability not to make an initial profit on Netflix and spread it around the world as being, you know, profit. Lack of profitability isn't a bad thing. It's a fucking terrible thing. And it's important for marketers because if we follow the, the, the line of sales or growth, it's often contradictory to the signpost pointing towards what marketing should tell us to do. But if you look for the profit signpost, in my experience at least, it's usually pointing in a very similar to direction to where marketing is telling us to go. So let's, that's number 10. Let's move to number nine. I'm moving pretty fast. Gary V. So I didn't mention uh, Gary in my first article and, and probably, the, well, certainly the most common accusation was that I could not have a list of marketing bullshit that did not include Gary V. And I originally I was going to put a post, a, a quote of his in about Instagram, but as I went through more and more of the Gary V corpus, it became apparent that it would be a shame to pick any one of his um, quotes. There are literally hundreds of nonsensical pieces of bullshit applied to marketing and more general topics that we really must celebrate in this session. Fuck, I don't even know where to begin. Um, what about you are alive, take advantage of it? Think about that for a second. You are alive take advantage of it. What does it mean? Um, there no longer has to be a difference between who you are and what you do. But they're not the same thing. Yeah, they never were. You know what I mean? Uh, social, this is my favorite. Social media is not a fad because it's human. I literally don't know what that means. And, and remember, I started with zero followers too. Well, well yeah, of course. Um, this is a good one. You're not lost. You're just early in the process. We can go on all night. So I don't want to pick any particular Gary V uh, uh, thought. I just want to put the whole cultural concept of Gary V in there at number nine. OK, now for number eight, I have to first make you imagine a scenario. So I want you to pretend you've been brought in as the marketing director or CMO of a large company. And one of the things you do early on, of course, is you look at where the company has been spending its money on communications. So you bring in this handsome fellow who's running marketing communications and you say to him, so take me through, you know, what's been working and, and how you're spending your money and, 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 and what's going on with the comms. And he says to you, look, I'll be honest with you, mate. I've got no fucking clue where half the money is, is going or whether it's working or what's going on. Half of it's working, half of it isn't. I really don't know. I couldn't tell you which half, right? You would fire him in about about four seconds, right? You'd be like, you're an idiot, right? Get out of the office. Well, this, of course, is exactly what we got from John Wanamaker, who comes in at number eight in our all-time league table. It's probably the most famous marketing quote of all time. Wanamaker, who's actually a bit of a genius and kind of the, the grandfather of modern retailing, once said, apocryphally we think half the money i spend on advertising is wasted the trouble is i don't know which half it's sometimes attributed to other people but wanamaka is the person that it was originally um, attached to so what's wrong with this and why is it bullshit well a couple of things we live in an era where at least in theory with multimedia modeling and econometrics we we we, we should be able to kind of get past this idea now, I'm, I'm reticent to go much further because I don't believe in, in either of those two things too much. My point is, if you think about the balance of, you know, what's working tactically in our communication spend, given many companies spend millions and millions of dollars on marketing comms each year, 
there's kind of a continuum between random anarchy, you know, donkeys painting shit, right? Random numbers, all the way through to, you know, 100% econometric, scientific, proven attribution, yeah? Now, I, I think both of these extremes are bullshit, right? No one does it randomly, and I, econometric sounds great, but never fucking works properly, right? But my point is Wanamaker takes us somewhere into the middle there where it's still unacceptable. And I would tell you there's a sweet spot. I don't think we know if everything is working and how well it's working. I just don't believe that's true. But I do think we have to be a lot more ambitious than Wanamaker in terms of what we're actually going to be able to attribute and allocate for. And, and the other problem I've got with, with Wanamaker's quote is, this is unfortunately the probably, again, the most famous marketing quote of all time. And it's one that other people in the organization know. They've heard, you know, yeah, ha ha, you know, half your money on advertising is wasted. You don't know which half, right? And the problem with that is the quote makes us sound like we haven't got the faintest fucking clue what we're doing, which in many cases is true, but in some exceptional cases is not. It does us harm in the discipline. So I think Wanamaker and the 50% quote has to go in there. Uh, with a score of 45. All right, on we go. Number seven, McKinsey and the idea that targeting existing customers is cheaper. So let's think about this for a second. You will have inevitably have heard this at some point in your career. You want to target existing customers because targeting existing brand oil customers is five times cheaper than trying to recruit new customers. Now, when I was growing up, I heard it was a McKinsey quote. The first thing I have to tell you, having spent time looking into this, is it wasn't a McKinsey quote, okay? It actually can be traced back through several different companies, the Harvard Business Review, Tom Peters. It's basically, you know, going back all the way through the 1980s, someone has made up an apocryphal study that was never properly actually done. And, and here's the point. It's not necessarily cheaper to target existing customers. You can't make that generalization. It depends what they're buying. And even if it is, as the great Wharton professor Pete Fader said a few years ago, who cares? Since when has being cheapness been one of the drivers of strategic choice? It might be cheaper to target existing customers, but what if non-customers are worth 10 or 20 or 40 times more money? And of course, we've got all the Ehrenberg penetration stuff, new customers, wada, 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 penetration, yada, yada. But my point would be, look, I don't know whether it's a good or a bad idea to target existing customers. And neither do you until you look at the market and do the proper research. Some phony ass bit of five times cheaper research shouldn't be guiding your hand because it's bullshit. All right, now we get to number six. It had to be there, I didn't include it. I was overcome with people saying, you have to put the golden circles in there. We are talking, of course, about Simon Sinek asking why. So you, you all should be familiar with the golden circle. Incidentally, one of the tips for bullshit, really world-class bullshit, is to put golden in front of something and shapes. We'll see it later, a different golden thing, but anyway. You all know this, it's all about why and how it's linked to the brain. This is about 10 years old now, but it's done enormous damage to our discipline. What I wanna do here is pause. I want to see an early version of Simon Sinek introducing this model. Look at how nonsensical it is from the very beginning. Admire the bullshit. He is a master of delivering bullshit in a dramatic way, but look at this shit. It smacks of bullshit from the very beginning. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operated it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little 
what a load of bollocks, right? The Wright brothers and Apple and Martin Luther King, they're his case studies for fuck's sake, right? What a load of nonsense. So what's wrong with it? Well, what's right with it first? Marketers want more, yeah? They're not satisfied in, in selling products that benefit needs. It's fundamentally disappointing to many of them. So the minute we start talking about, oh, now we're speaking to why and what, what's the real purpose of all this, you start to get them on board very quickly. But the problem is consumers usually don't. Now, the key word here is usually. Look at anyone like Cinex selling the purpose bandwagon. It works. Purpose works. Why works? It's always the same. It always works, right? That's not true. Sometimes it does work and that purpose can have a place, but usually it doesn't. And usually customers don't care. They say they do in a little bit of honky research, but the reality is they won't pay for it or they'll take product functionality over the Y driver. It's also way too far up the benefit ladder if you understand how to position brands. The great cartoonist Tom Fishburne captured it beautifully. We, we've gone so far up, we've entered an era of bullshit way beyond the product feature or the product benefit. We've gone to a place beyond any credibility. And ultimately purpose is a, a form of positioning. And like any positioning, if you're gonna position a brand, you have to pass the three Cs. Does my customer want it? Can I deliver on it better than or different from the competition? And again and again with purpose, we see customers don't really want it, companies aren't really delivering on it, and every competitor has something very, very similar. But most importantly, and the reason why the golden circle and ask why is bullshit, is because it makes brands more important than they are. Brands are portrayed here as big things where people care about the purpose of the company and uh, that's fundamentally more often than not, not the case. Brands are little, little things that customers really don't give a fuck about. And that's the way to think about them. Never mind asking why, customers can't ask any questions of brands most of the time. All right, now we're getting to the top five. So it's getting pretty bullshitty now, prepare yourself. Put on your, your long wading boots for the next one. Ooh, Tropicana's new packaging. So. Um, just over 10 years ago, Pepsi wanted a new logo, and they hired the, the Arnell Group, uh, headed by wondrous marketer, ad man, Peter Arnell, who produced, and it was leaked to the press, the breathtaking um, uh, proposal uh, to PepsiCo on how they were gonna change the Pepsi logo. It included all kinds of made up scribbling bullshit about the old Pepsi logo. It included weird diagrams about gravity and shit. It even had, the golden ratio, you see the link with the golden circle and the golden ratio and the Mona Lisa and all that shit, the golden ratio. And as a result of all that fine work, the Arnell Group were able to produce this masterpiece. Yes, the new Pepsi logo. Well, having done that work a year later, they were called in to do their Tropicana rebrand. You may remember this, yeah? They took the existing Tropicana packaging and created something entirely generic instead, and spent a fortune on advertising too. Why was this such a big pile of bullshit? Well, first, as we all know, there was a shit ton of distinctive assets that were thrown out the window, and the new design looked very, very generic. Second, it's an almighty amount of money. It was only a few months before PepsiCo went, fuck that, go back to the old packaging. But by all accounts, there was a million dollars to the Arnell Group, 40 million bucks of advertising and 30 million bucks of lost sales before Pepsi did the 180. But the reason this is so high in the list is because of Peter Arnell. Don't talk to me about Gary V. Don't talk to me about Simon Sinek. You want the king of marketing bullshit. You need Peter Arnell. When I was putting this list together, two of the great thinkers of marketing, both Byron Sharp and Bob the ad contrarian Hoffman, both suggested Arnell. And this particular speech, which is the zenith of bullshit presentations, I give you Peter Arnell explaining why he's going to fuck up the Tropicana packaging and making every single syllable nonsensically up. I uh, started on a journey uh, approximately um, uh, five months ago <clears throat> to try to give a, a new refresh, a new energy to Tropicana. So we thought it would be very, very important to take this uh, this brand and bring it or evolve it into a more um, uh, current 
a modern state. Emotionally, it was very, very difficult, and it still remains difficult for everyone to grasp the importance of that change was so dramatic. But of course, historically, we always showed the outside of the orange. Um, what was fascinating uh, was, of course, that we had never shown the product called the juice. There was a, a, a strong drive to bring a big messaging onto the carton where the biggest single billboarding was. Having said that, we wanted to take the orange and put it somewhere. We engineered um, this interesting little squeeze cap here, which you guys could call up and see after, so that um, the notion of squeezing the orange was implied ergonomically every day when you actually went to the actual carton. The skin of the orange is replicated on the cap and tooled into the cap. The idea, of course, is to have a consistency between the purity of the juice, which is coming directly from the orange, the cap, which you squeeze every day, and of course, the carton, right? Um, now, the reason why that's all important, because of course, squeeze also maintains a certain level of, I guess, um, uh, power when it comes to this notion emotionally about what squeeze means, like my squeeze or give me a squeeze or the notion of a hug or the ideas behind, you know, the, um, the power of, uh, of, 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 of love and the idea of transferring that love or converting that attitude between mom and the kids, right? Right. Uh, the master. I, I, you're never going to get anything better than that. Just stunning in its level of bullshit. So Tropicana makes it to number five with a score of 50. To number four, well, Mark Zuckerberg, um, not a man always uh, capable of bullshit, but his finest hour about 13 or 14 years ago. Um, it, it's probably one of the most important dates in marketing communications history. Facebook had been growing globally, but it hadn't yet done any advertising. So 250 of the world's biggest clients and agencies were brought to New York City and Zuckerberg addressed them all with the announcement of what would become Facebook's incredibly successful advertising mission. And at the time he said, at his intro, this is about to herald a completely new way of advertising online. And he went on during an astonishing talk to tell those advertisers that, that and this is a direct quote, for the last hundred years, media has been pushed out to people, but now marketers are gonna be part of the conversation. And they're gonna do this by using the social graph in the same way our users do. We're no longer gonna be pushing out information. Instead, we're gonna be part of this wonderful, organic, interactive dialogue and conversation, which of course turned out to be complete bullshit because Facebook advertising, very effective as it is, looks not that dissimilar to every other kind of advertising going back to prehistoric times. So why is this bullshit? It was very damaging bullshit, um, although it was very successful for Facebook. It created, if you remember 10 years ago, that um, naive belief that we were now gonna have conversations with customers and it was all gonna be organic and lovely and boo hiss, traditional advertising, boo, full of shit. We're gonna talk and, and be friends with our customers. And we forget now what a load of bollocks that was, but how many people fell for that bullshit. More importantly, I believe this set up those two silos between traditional and digital. This idea that we're 100 years of oh, boo, shit, oh, rubbish. We're now gonna do it in a different way. It stopped digital from just being other tools in this beautiful array of different communications tactics and turned it into these two different paradigms and, and, and set up a frankly unhealthy idea that every new successful communications platform that carries advertising from now on isn't just an addition, it's something new that will kill the old and it's still happening. You know, you look at TikTok's um, uh, commercialization last year, don't make ads, make TikToks, it's the same fundamental premise. This is different. This is gonna change everything. And in reality, it doesn't. It complements, it integrates, but it creates this unhealthy bullshit idea that the new stuff is completely different from the old stuff. So at number three, the bronze medal, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I've pulled it back a little bit on, in terms of its nonsense factor, 
but its damage score remains at 10. It, it's been massively damaging to a, a shit ton of marketers over the last 60 or 70 years. So you all know Maslow, every marketer knows Maslow, right? At the bottom, we have our physiological needs. I need to take a piss. And at the top, we have our esteem and self-actualization. I want to look cool and trendy. What Maslow's hierarchy tells us is when I really, really need to take a piss, I don't care if I look foolish doing it because I really, really need to take a piss. Now, you might think that's just a silly example. It's not. That's all the hierarchy really does for us. And frankly, that's stretching it far more than you really should. Everyone talks about Maslow, but no one ever looks into what a massive pile of bullshit it is. First, it was derived from a tiny sample of Native Americans living in southern Canada, the, the Blackfoot people. Um, that's where the data apparently comes from. The Blackfoot themselves reviewed what Maslow had to say about their orientations and aspirations and commented in a very intellectual and frankly far more advanced way that this was a load of bollocks and didn't capture the tribe's philosophy at all. Their tribe's philosophy was far more nuanced than this silly little theory of Maslow and Maslow didn't disagree. It, but even worse criticisms came from social scientists during the 1960s as Maslow's theories began to pick up. One particularly famous theorist said this is based on a bad or even poor experiment and, and, and said, I'm a little worried about this stuff, which I consider tentative, being swallowed whole by all sorts of enthusiastic people. So who was so worried about these limitations of this, frankly, tentative, ropey theory? His name was Abraham Maslow, and he was really worried that some of the shit that people had been reading that he'd written 20 years earlier was actually not that good. It was also never intended as a hierarchy. It was only when we got into management textbooks that we started to put it into triangles. Maslow never had a hierarchy. And most importantly, what's the fucking relevance to marketing, right? You know, you sell industrial welding equipment. What does this do for you? What does this tell you? What, why would you bother with this shit? It's total bullshit. Even Maslow basically thought it was bullshit. Why 50 years later? Is it in your marketing plan? What role does it play? So why is Maslow so popular? Well, I'll tell you why. First, because it's incredibly simple to understand for people that need things that are simple to understand. It's also got the handy bonus of a foreign intellectual sounding name. If Maslow had been called Smith or Thompson or, you know, Jones, I don't think this would have caught on. But Maslow. It sounds faintly European, faintly clever. Maslow, yes, yes, Maslow. And of course, everyone learned it in their shit undergraduate degrees. And that was pretty much all they learned in their shit undergraduate degrees. And when you have no other models or training or idea about marketing, brand management or anything else, you cling to anything you've got, which in this case is Maslow's dodgy pyramid. And, and unfortunately, that also applies to other dodgy, largely pointless tools like SWOT, PEST, BCG, and Jungian Architects, all hallmarks of a completely wank brand plan done by someone that doesn't have decent training in marketing and brand management. They all go together, right? They all go together. All right, next, I've just mentioned it, brand archetypes. What a load of bollocks and defended by far too many people. Nonsense factor high, damage score also high. So brand archetypes, as you probably know, are based on uh, cod Jungian psychology, that there are eternal recurring characteristic tropes. In this case, things like the lover or the jester or the everyman. And brands fall into one of these distinct dozen categories, kind of like horoscopes. So Audi is the sage and Apple is the magician, sometimes the creator, sometimes the magician. Chanel is the lover. Pampers is the caregiver, Ikea is the regular guy, and on and on the nonsense goes. So what's the problem with brand archetypes? Well, first of all, what, what's the benefit? Again, I'm marketing industrial welding equipment and my brand consultant tells me I'm the jester. What the fuck am I gonna do with that, right? It's just complete nonsense. It also encourages non-empiricism. Rather than going out and doing proper research, Rather than doing a proper funnel design, proper understanding brand perceptions and P-maps, we come up with the jester or the sage and we're kind of done, right? 
I've worked for, no exaggeration, I've picked up the pieces for about six clients that have worked with a half-assed brand consulting firm who's left them with, you're the lover, you're the everyman, you're the minor, whatever it is, right? And they've asked me genuinely when I've walked in, what do we do with this? And I've said to them, you need to throw it away. I worked for, worked for a women's beauty product company that had been told they were the cowboy, right? And they were genuinely in the same, so we, we know we're the cowboy, but what do we do about that? And I'm like, burn it, burn it all. It also, again, um, similar, similar to Wanamaker's quote, makes us all look like total tits to the rest of the company. Think about the typical CFO or COO or sales manager, right? And think about the fact they learn that what we've been doing is sitting looking at a Zodiac style wheel, deciding that we're the jester. How does that make us look? It makes us look like idiots. But there's one other reason I'm particularly against this stupid approach. It's a generic theory of brand. Every brand fits into one of the 12 different archetypes. The most fundamental understanding of brand is that it is the opposite of a generic system. If you don't believe me, look in the fucking dictionary. The antonym of generic is branded. What does that tell you? It tells you that coming up with the idea that you're one of 12 things, a generic category uh, categorization, runs against every principle of brand. Understand the brand in itself. Understand its heritage. Understand what drives the loyalists understand what's in this brand because that's what brands are they're not generic ridiculous recurring 12 different archetypes which leaves us with only one more to go i've decided after much contemplation and calculations that ross reeves and the usp should be at the top of my list why is that well it's not as nonsensical as archetypes or tropicana's new packaging but again, the damage that it's done over the years to brands and to marketers is not to be underestimated. So Russell Reeves was a cool dude, no doubt about that. He has the best profile pictures on the planet, which always involve him smoking um, some ludicrously refined 50s cigarette. And the USP itself is a fascinating concept. It's bullshit, but my God, like the other stuff, like the golden circle and the rest, it sounds uh, with face validity very good. So Rosser Reeves said, for things to work, you need an advertisement which must make a proposition to the consumer. The proposition must be one that the competition cannot or does not offer. And then three, it must be so strong that it motivates customers to act. The bit in the middle is the thing that should trouble you. The proposition of the USP, the you in the USP, is one that the competition cannot or does not offer. Differentiate or die. So what's wrong with that? Does unique even exist? In my experience and the experience of almost everyone else that's looked at uh, perceptual data, the simple answer is it doesn't. No one even owns an attribute. Very rare you see that, let alone they have an attribute that no one else has. And even if let's say you could own a, an attribute and it's unique to you, yeah, can you sustain it given the amount of replicability that's out there? And my point is, why does it have to be unique? Why can't it be a relative advantage? Why do we push the uniqueness so much? What if I'm just taller or faster or quicker? Okay, I can see that having a unique attribute would be brilliant, but given it's impractical and largely impossible, why not just be more of something, simply better, as Paddy Bowers once said. And finally, as we learn more and more about distinctiveness, we learn that's more important anyhow. It's not that we are different. It's that we come to mind first. It's not that we run the race differently. It's that we run it quicker and come into the cognitive thinking of our target customer first. And on that, there is much more to be um, admired. So there it is. Our final definitive top 10 list. Behold the bullshit. Now, a couple of things before we finish. Nadia Lotta pointed out at the time, she'd be interested to see the list in reverse. What would the top 10 marketing non-BS list be? Well, I think there's a simple way to do it. Take the BS list and invert it. And you know what? You get some pretty good advice about what you should do to be successful in marketing. If this is BS, the opposite is probably good advice. So number 10, profit matters. Worry about profitability and let it guide your actions. Gary V. 
Do you remember that op episode of Seinfeld where George Costanza did the exact opposite and was very successful? That's what I would do with all of Gary V's advice. I would invert it and do the opposite. Shit, even Gary V agrees. He recently tweeted, watch what I do, not what I say. Try and account for 100% of your advertising effect. It'll never be possible, but don't feel happy with Wanamaker's 50%. Try and explain everything. At least have a go. Uh, McKinsey, brand loyalty is cheaper. It, it maybe isn't, and it certainly isn't better. Step back, look at your funnel, and work out what your objective should be year in, year out. Cynex, ask why. Don't do that. Focus instead on the benefit that customers truly want. It might be why. Sometimes it probably isn't most of the time. Get anchored in the world of the customer, not the golden circles of Simon Sinek. Tropicana's new packaging. Don't do that shit. Never rebrand. Never redo packaging like that. Evolve it. Revitalize it. But don't do what Arnett was doing with Tropicana. Maintain your distinctive codes. Um, never alter them. Just update them and keep them present. Zuckerberg's ad revolution. Ignore it. Facebook have these days. It's all just communications. Treat it all equally. Learn to integrate it together as a common suite. There's no such thing as digital or traditional. They're silos and mental models that get in the way of doing better comms. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Fuck Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's nonsensical. Instead, go back to research and understand your market drivers. You don't need, again, these generic models. Listen to your customers, understand what they want, and position your brands accordingly. Similar to that, brand architects, get rid of all that Zodiac nonsense. All you have to do is, again, do a proper diagnosis and position your brand as your brand and only your brand could be positioned. And finally, the USB. You need to think about distinctiveness and you can think about differentiation as a relative concept and a combination of different things rather than some unique, amazing holy grail that you'll never get. My point is that if you invert the bullshit, you get some pretty good advice on how to do good marketing. And weirdly, almost coincidentally, all of these non-bullshit things are covered in the mini MBA in marketing. Or perhaps that's also bullshit too. All right, I'm done, Russell. That's me done. Thank you very much, Mark. There we have it. The um Oh, you can't see me. Bear with me a moment. I'll uh, put my list back up. Oh, there we go. There we go. I'm here. I'm uh, visible and people can hear me. Thank you, Mark. So there we have it. The uh, the definitive uh, top 10 marketing bullshit of all time. I'm particularly happy to see uh, Peter Arnold still made the final list. That's um, the most comprehensive Has bunch to be. of without substance that I think I've ever heard <laughs> and no self-awareness whatsoever uh, bless him uh, thank you for that and thank you for everybody who's posed their own comments uh, some questions um, a lot of agreement let me just answer a few questions before we go any further lots of people asking whether or not this recording will be available afterwards it will be uh, anybody who does want to watch it again or share it with others uh, I think it'll be available I imagine in the next few days, um, I'm sure um, we'll send you a link to everybody who's registered. Um, so uh, lots of people who are agreeing with you. Uh, there's even a sliver of support for Gary Vee, but let's not go there. Um, a couple of people who are pointing out things that aren't there. Um, so let me start with those. Uh, one I know would have been in contention for your own list, Mark, uh, the SWOT analysis few people uh, observing yeah. that actually there um i know you're not a fan uh, which uh, to somebody like myself who's done many on their own brand over the years uh, i'd like to know why it's such a bad thing well it, it is bullshit it's a good call uh, first of all very good call it, it scores very high on damage because it's it's infiltrated most bad company planning sessions it's not nonsensical though, it's just useless. So the, the point about SWOT is never in the history of management has anyone drawn that quadrant, spent eight hours inanely filling it out on a whiteboard and then gone, holy fuck, look in that top left corner, our competitor's new brand is a threat next year. We need to do something about it, right? 
it, it's obvious to the point of banality, but that doesn't make it bullshit. It just makes it pointless. So it scored one or two on the non uh, on the da on the nonsense scale, uh, but ten on the damage. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely right. It, it's it's nonsensical. It's useless and nonsensical, but didn't make it into the top ten, unfortunately. Um, thank you for that. Uh, somebody else mentioning love marks. Um, what do you what do you make of the concept of love marks? I think that's absolute a cock, absolute and total cock, bang on the money. But it only made it into the high thirties, very high on the nonsense scale. Um, but the damage it's done is relatively limited now. Um, Certainly, if you go back 10 or 12 years, it was percolating for a while, but it has pretty much disappeared now. And that's great because it was a massive amount of bollocks. Uh, a question uh, here, um, and um, they've requested anonymity, so I'll, I'll respect that. Um, how best, um, as an ad agency, how best can we convince clients to stop using this type of uh, BS to inform their briefs to us. So, um, from for, for, for the agency community out there, what, what would you advise them? I'm not even sure they should, Russell. Right? I, I do feel an agency's pain. Um, when I was a more junior member of the academic world doing consulting, I certainly wasn't in a position to say to someone, "That's a load of bollocks," even though I knew it was a load of bollocks. So I took my money, and I did what the client wanted. It's only in later life where I've been liberated by the fact that I don't give a fuck anymore. And also that clients are coming to me now saying, we've come to you specifically because we want you to tell us what's bollocks. Now that's great, but it doesn't mean I'm being brave. It means I'm just delivering on what the client wants. So I, I do feel agency's pain, but uh, you know I, I've just said to you a minute ago, I think SWAT is a load of bollocks. I've always thought it's a load of bollocks. I must have spent at least 10 days of my life sitting there with a marker pen with clients working on SWOT, not because I you know, thought it was good, but because the client decides. So I think my advice to agencies is suck it up and learn to live with the bullshit. Um, it's a very tricky thing to convince a client. I mean, show them this video and let me, let me help you to destroy it. So you can play this video and go, look at Richard, ooh, he's saying some horrible things there, isn't he? Ooh, what do we think about that? And then go whichever way the wind blows. It's very hard when a client's paying you to tell them what they think is a load of bollocks. So use me. I will be your stunt professor. Throw me in there and, and let them shit all over me. I'm I'm comfortable with that. Uh, sound advice. Uh, uh, let Mark be your support network. Um, I, I just looking down the list. This I, unless I've misread this. I think the majority are relatively new things or new people to the scene. Um, why yeah. is why why is there more examples of bullshit, let's say, in the last ten years than there has historically been? It's a good. I mean, it is something I did look at. So there are some, you know, some classics from the from the early part of, of latter day century, but there are a few modern ones as well. I think the amount of bullshit has certainly increased with the advent of social media. Um, it's possible, I think, with confidence to be able to pretty much say anything now and have a lot of people share that opinion. And I, I don't think we had that. You know, it's been 10 years max, really. You know, m most academics in marketing, I know that some of them let everyone down and they weren't very interesting in teaching you and everything else. I get that. But they they were also relatively careful about what they what they said and, and based it on evidence. Unfortunately, now there's a lot of people with a lot more. I mean, let's, I mean Gary Vee's a delightful fellow, first of all, and, 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 and very nice to people. He's not a bad chap, but he has a hundred times more impact than me and Byron Sharp combined on, on marketing thought right now, and Phil Kotler thrown in as well, right? So when you've got someone with the ability to produce that much content about that with that much bullshit inside it, you 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 know, you're fighting a losing battle. So yeah, bull, the bullshit quotient is certainly increasing. But again, there are classics there, right? You've got to look at, you know, Wanamaker's is, is a big one. Zuckerberg's 10 years old. Maslow's 60, 70 years old. So there are some classics there that will be hard to dislodge. I mean, that's a question of my own, really. You've sort of 
hinted at an answer already there, but I mean, people like Gary Vee and Simon Sinek, I mean, these people are colossally successful if success is measured by uh, the positive Bullshit. comments that they get. Well, yeah, but I mean, so is it their fault? I mean, maybe, maybe I'm peeling away at layers of psychology here, but is it their fault? You know, because pe people want this stuff and yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, look, let's be clear. I mean it. I'm half I'm half impressed. If you look at the full Simon Sinek presentation on the Golden Circle, it, it's horrifying and entrancing at the same time that you can produce that much horseshit delivered with such drama and authorities. It's truly impressive. I mean, the ways I discovered, it's the other way than you expect. Look over here, not over here. You half expect him to pull something out of one of his sleeves. You know what I mean? It's phenomenal delivery and showmanship, but at the heart of it is total bullshit. And I think that's that's one of the big lessons here. You've got a lot of people that can deliver with total authority, absolute bollocks, which I, I really think is something to be admired, but it has a massive detrimental impact on, on marketing. And I think what it also illustrates us is we need to be critical. So the word critical, unfortunately, has more negative connotations than positive these days, right? Critical thinking is a good thing, right? The next time, you know, you see a Gary V Instagram post about something fucking stupid, ask yourself, this is, is this nonsense, right? Don't just go along with it. So, no, I admire these people for their ability to deliver bullshit. Uh, produce enormous amounts of, of of influence and income as a result. Good on them. I mean, if you can get away with it, get away with it, right? But it does it does suggest that marketers are deludable, you know, if there is such a word, uh, in large numbers. Easily deluded, uh, deludable. Uh, either or, it's fine. Deludible. On that, uh, and this is a question. I mean, obviously, Simon Sinek's uh, inclusion was very much uh, to represent purpose um which is clearly a a a better noir of yours uh and where does i get again um there's, there's there's thousands and thousands of marketers uh worldwide who are bought in uh to the purpose uh they deliver it as a mantra as an absolute necessity yep. and every single one yep. of those wrong i mean they, surely they can't be these are clever people in charge of millions of pounds of marketing budget influential leaders in very successful companies there must be yep. a modicum of, they must be a modicum no, of non no, right? no no probably not i mean first of all yeah there are some companies that have a genuine purpose so first of all let's put a little bucket of i don't know five percent over there right there's no absolutes second brand purpose does have a much more legitimate role in terms of the employer brand making people feel like they're here not just to make widgets, but they have a bigger role to play. I, I think that's more legit as well. But the rest of it is just bollocks. Uh, you've got to remember about half the CMOs in the world, even at biggest companies, have no fucking clue what they're doing. We, you've had these conversations too. You just can't admit it, right? We all have these conversations at a certain age and a certain level where I go, hey, she gave a great speech. She seems, and one of the other people that I respect in the world will go, about half of them are just following random pieces of knowledge um, and don't have a clue what they're doing. They're just playing the angles. There's another half that know it's all bullshit, but they're not going to do what I do because they can't. They're going to go, oh, yeah, brand purpose is very important to us because it might get me the next job as the CMO of a large bank. So, yeah, there's a lot of private conversations that go on um, about brand purpose. Never forget, never forget what happened when around that time we talked about Zuckerberg earlier and we talked about organic social media and people having relationships with brands. That was all cock, total cock. And most of the industry fell for it and, and started believing that if you set up an organic uh, relationship with all your customers on social media, it was a whole new way of doing business. And of course, that was all bollocks, right? Social media was no such thing. It was just another way of doing effective advertising so now purpose is a lot of bollocks for most companies but i appreciate you can't just stand up and say it um because you know you you look you look like an idiot I, you know i'm fully aware that many people think i'm a complete idiot because i think most companies brand purpose statements are total bollocks hmm. uh mark another mark's got a question for you 
uh, what brands do you consider being, uh, sorry, forgive me, being best, oh, let me rephrase the question. What brands do you consider that should use your inverted BS ranking? I imagine most D2C brands um, should certainly start with profitability in your mind, but uh, which brands would most yeah. benefit from uh, your inverted ranking? Well, Mondelez could probably do it uh, do a little bit of help there at the moment based on what's going on there. Um, yeah, but I think you've called it nicely. I, I think one of the things we've seen is that it's not just that D2C brands have been given too much credit. They're kind of the one that everyone focuses on as like the success brands. When in reality, they're complete, again, no absolutes, but they're usually completely and utterly useless at actually making money in the long, long term. And the only way they end up becoming profitable is not going direct to consumers, but going indirect and doing traditional advertising and all the things that they said they weren't going to do in the first part. So, yeah, I think if you look at the D2C brands, they can still talk bollocks um, when they're trying to um, attract investors and get PR coverage. But if they inverted most of this stuff, they would be doing a lot better. And, and many of them are. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for everybody who has uh, posed their questions. Lots of people suggesting um, things or, or maybe suggesting to you, maybe trying to poke or provoke you into uh, including them in any other list that you might do. Um, what, what was the best one? So what was the one you saw that you thought I missed? Because I'm still conscious I might have missed something well, here. Uh, there's a couple of... Uh, <laughs> Are somebody suggesting or that they were surprised not to see Byron Sharp on your list? Although I think that's probably a misreading on your thoughts on. Uh, well, let's do that. On, let's on, do on that one. Byron. Yeah, I, I don't think Byron is is full of bullshit. I think he over eggs his Ehrenberg Bass pudding a little bit more than people realise. But he he you know I, I have to tell you, man, it fucking pains me to say it, right? But a lot of his calls that everybody thought was bullshit, they aren't bullshit. I mean, I don't believe in complete mass marketing, right? I believe in two speed. But I looked at his stuff on mass marketing 10 years ago and fuck off, that can't be right. He makes a very good case for it, right? Same thing with distinctiveness, you know, more recently. Same thing with penetration. So, yeah, he's not full of bullshit. He certainly, he spins, he spins his balls with more polish than you might realize. but yeah, he's not he's not a bullshitter, he's by he's, he's he's actually the opposite. And somebody also suggesting at what point Fernando Mercado of Burger King is added to the list. Um maybe the point is not Again, it's about a... Fernando, more about uh, Burger King being held up as a as a as a poster child of success. Yeah. Totally agree. I mean, Burger King's massively overrated. I can't remember the numbers. McDonald's has beaten them in same store sales. I think it's nine out of 10 quarters, something like that, right? No one talks about Maccas and yet they're doing a great job. But again, I don't think Fernando or Burger King are bad. I just think they're overrated. Um, and, and, and in reality, that doesn't get you on the bullshit list. It, it, you know, good luck to him, I think. He's not, I mean, it's not bullshit. It's, it's overrated, which is a different thing. It doesn't get close to this kind of monumental shit here. No, absolutely not. I'm cautious of time, but uh, one more, uh, Andreas Gunderson, who was complaining early doors that uh, he was in back pain as a result of all the cringing, which I think is a, a bit of sweet. I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, he um, uh, And just for that, I feel like I should throw him uh, the final word or the final provocation to you. Um, Shame on me. I don't know who this person is. Uh, Michael Porter. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it, oh, yeah, but I've got to tell you, it's not close enough to our world. I mean, five forces, yeah, yeah, but not the damage score to marketers. It doesn't come up a lot in our world. There's, there is bullshit attached to it, I, I agree. But yeah, it's not a big one for us, I would say, is my defense there. Don't disagree. The great porter, full of a bit of shit there. But nah, it's um it's not big enough on our radar to have enough impact, I think. Okay. I'm gonna slip one more in um at risk of um the uh, platform exploding because we're two minutes over. This is from Anita Sahu. Um 
uh, where do you rank things like advertising is dead it's all pr influence word of mouth i offer you that one yeah. as, uh, as to I, knock it i think that's a very good point that's anita's making a great point there the general death myth i think is very very true the problem is it's kind of uh i wanted to attribute something to 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 each of the points of bullshit you know what i mean or it to be an actual concept so i'm not disagreeing i think there's a lot about death that we could have had it's a nice call but there isn't one person that said it you know what i mean it's kind of it's all over the place but nice thinking definitely bullshit wonderful and on that note that definitive note uh, let us uh, wrap up uh, today. We've had loads more questions, loads more suggestions since we began this Q&A. Um, and forgive me that we didn't get a chance to get through ever, uh, every single one of them. Um, perhaps you can post in response and reaction on, uh, on LinkedIn and do share uh, the link to register to watch this on demand uh, later. Uh, but thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for going through your top ten. Can, I ask, can I ask our punters as well, if you guys don't mind, take a screenshot of the list and by all means, you know, pull it apart and put post something that says I missed something or one thing was too high and something else should have been too high. I'd love it if we can start a proper debate about making more people aware of what is and isn't bullshit. Have a go at me. I'm I'm up for it, maybe. I don't care. But, yeah. you know, screenshot this and then tell me what was wrong, because I will read all those comments and try and send them out, you know, post something. Let's have a discussion about it and, you know, don't hold back. What what did we miss? Um, let's go. Let's make this a proper debate. It's too it's too optimistic and, and fluffy out there. Let's be a little bit more critical in a good way about things. I think I think that's one of the things that resonated with me. It's the uh, the need for critical thinking. I mean, we can kick this stuff around and it's a bit of fun here and there. Uh, we get to slay a few sacred cows. But actually, the thing that you uh, did towards the end of your presentation in the inverted list then becomes a template or at least a starting point for conversation about what good looks like, not just a uh, let's throw some rocks at, uh, at some stuffs uh, that uh, is quite obviously nonsense or bullshit. As, uh, as is the uh, the word of the morning. Uh, so thank you to everybody that watched. Thank you very much to Mark and uh, we'll see you all next time. Take care.